So are supposed to be now on steel stillman that I teach in the program on the mailing in the fall. Um, and this is Eileen Quinlan, who's our visitor for the day. Um, and basically she's gonna I'm gonna introduce her very briefly here and then she's gonna give a talk for yeah, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, show a little bit of video, and then uh, she has said that if you guys have questions along the way, that you're welcome to kind of ask them. Uh, we will definitely do some Q&A at the end. Um, I guess I, sh I would say, though, that if you're going to be asking questions along the way, be a little bit sensitive to how many questions get asked along the way so that we can kind of keep, keep moving along. Um, I guess I'll be the traffic cop if it gets out of hand. Um, the, uh, so I'm gonna just read you a little bit of this introduction. Um, Eileen Quinlan describes herself as, a, and in fact, this is, this is um, an introduction that I wrote. I did a piece, uh, interview with Eileen in Art of America a couple of years ago, and this is actually correct in the introduction. So a little bit of it's out of date, but I'm trying to kind of freshen it and she'll correct me. Um, Eileen Quinlan describes herself, has described herself, I guess, as a still life photographer. Born in 1972, she has become well known in recent years as one of a cohort of photographers. Wally Beshti and Liz Deschen, who teaches here, of course, are notable others, who, following in the footsteps of practitioners from the Holy Nash to James Lauren, have been disassembling a layered apparatus of photography. Light, subject, optics, chemistry, bites, the material image and finding new ways to make meaning. Often stunningly beautiful, Quinlan's work, Eileen's work, is surprisingly straightforward. She's used medium and large format cameras and studio strobes to, stru to shoot tabletop, house of card-like worlds. She's moved on a little bit from some of this work, which we'll talk about that. The best known of which uh, were these angular constructions staged for the camera's lens in which she propped mirrors in which propped mirrors reflect intensely colored light, deep shadow, bits of fabric, reflective mylar, wisps of smoke, other photographs, and especially one another. The resulting Im images offer kaleidoscope views into, the, into indefinite and often infinite spaces. Eileen attended the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, um, Tufts University in Boston, mm -hmm. graduated with a BFA, graduated from there with a BFA in 96, she moved to New York in 99, worked for a while in advertising and fashion as an assistant to commercial photographers before earning an MFA from Columbia in 2005. In the last eight years, she has had 10 or so solo shows in the US and Europe, including her first museum solo, maybe, um, at the ICA in Boston in 2009. Her work has appeared in dozens of group shows. In 2012, this last fall, she had a two-person show with Matt Keegan at the kitchen, uh, which I hope some of you saw. I think we'll probably have a little bit of work from that. And a solo at uh, Campoli Presti in London. <coughs> so please welcome. shots of my hands at a keyboard, ventured into ersatz ghost photography, which led me to smoking fetishism, and finally to the slippery still lives that have gripped me for the last several years. My background working with commercial photographers and an earlier stint in advertising has influenced me greatly. The Smoke and Mirrors series, which inaugurated my continuing engagement with not really abstraction, was fueled by my interest in a kind of seductive atmosphere that is both <coughs> indefinite yet familiar. I continue to explore these textures and a number of other things from installation strategies to photo distribution forms to the limits of the studio as a site for production. Art historical moments are obliquely and unintentionally invoked in the resulting images. My process involves both intuition, chance, and conscious intention and control. 
Rather than seeking clarity, I proceeded in a state of uncertainty and ambivalence, favoring accumulation and incongruity over purity and harmony. So I'm starting here with um, some ghost photos. These photos are from roughly the 1860s. Uh, since I became interested in photography as a child, I've always um, enjoyed the way that photographs can make incredible things credible or believable. And so I've spent a lot of years looking at ghost photographs. And in graduate school, um, in the early 2000s, I started thinking about what contemporary ghost photography might look like. I'm forwarding it. Okay. So I was talking about the fact that I had long looked at these images of 19th century ghost photographs. And as you can see, the ghost is depicted as a shrouded figure, as a transparent apparition in the background. And um, these photos were actually taken by William Mumler, who's a famous spirit photographer um, operating out of Boston in the 1860s. I think part of the reason ghost photography was so popular at the time was because the nation was living through the Civil War, and there was a great kind of sense of mortality and need to commute. The other side. So these are um, 19th century ghost photographs. Photographs tended of spirits tended to look like this until late in the 20th century when they started to look like this. Um, I, when I was in graduate school, I got interested in collecting images of contemporary ghost photography and thinking about ghosts in the aughts or the turn of the century or the turn of the millennium actually was that ghosts no longer took human form. They existed as a kind of war. <clears throat> these twin ghosts here or as smoke, a cloud, something formless and disembodied. And what was interesting to me about these images was also the way that people made these elaborate defenses for their authenticity. Because clearly, if you've ever smoked a cigarette while you were taking a photograph, you might have <clears throat> gotten a result like this. Or this can happen when dust gets on your lens and is illuminated by a flash. But people had a strong desire to believe that these were actually images of some sort of ectoplasmic matter. So while I was in school, I decided to try to forge some of these images myself. So far, these are all um, found ghost photographs. This one I have myself. And I, I realized that smoke is actually quite difficult to photograph. So I started setting up these little experiments um, where I would just isolate the smoke in the studio and try to find <coughs> different ways to make it appear more, have more volume. And these were the first photos that came out of those experiments. I didn't in any way think of them as art. I was planning on taking this ghostly body and putting it back into some kind of a scene. But I was for some time just working with different material. And I realized that with mirrors, I could double the volume of the smoke because it was, it was literally there in the scene, but it was also reflected. I could bounce light, give it more heft. I was experimenting with producing the smoke via cigarettes. I was trying to quit smoking at the time, so I was obsessed with smoking. And there were, many um, layers to this, and I was also using smoke machines. And I was producing these pictures, which I didn't really, again, think of as my work. It was more like um, an experiment. And as I was working on this, I realized that I was more interested in these kind of sketches than I was in any kind of narrative that I was trying to graft onto them, <coughs> uh, placing the smoke in more of a scene. And so I gave myself permission to make these smoke pictures more elaborate. And I did that with some of the skills that I had sort of acquired over the years working for commercial photographers. I learned a lot um, working for product photographers and fashion photographers about studio lighting and working with gels and setting up these rigs. I used to work with a still life photographer who photographed makeup for Clinique. And he would have these huge stages where he would position a tiny tube of lipstick where there would be pieces of foam and, and sometimes dry ice or smoke and different kinds of lighting, different sorts of mirrors and mylar just ways of sculpting and bouncing the light. So I applied some of those skills to this subject, which was smoke. And it was exciting and a little tricky to be making this work in graduate school because I didn't really know what it was about. And as many of you know, in school you have to answer for yourself quite a bit in terms of theorizing about what your work is about. But I somehow managed to proceed not really knowing about what I was saying so much. When people ask me what it was about, I would say it was product photography. Product. And these images constituted um, the last few slides that I've shown you. These three were part of my thesis show when I graduated from school. And the kind of architectural elements that you see in the photographs, these bars, <clears throat> pieces of wood, they were part of this rig that I built to 
slot the mirrors in and out of. Over, over time, I allow them to enter the images and become part of it. So they create another sort of stage that's a bit ambiguous, but maybe gives um, gives the viewer more to think about what you want. I think something else I was thinking about too at the time was just learning how to make the most of my natural kind of tendencies. Like I, I'm kind of a shy person, so photographing people on the street has never worked so well for me. Though I've tried just about every kind of photography over the years and working with it in undergrad and on my own in undergrad school. And I think I think it's really important if you if you want to make art over a, over the long term to to think about like your habits and your limits and your tendencies, <coughs> things that you embrace, things that you are uncomfortable with and find ways to make that work for you. My shyness, my sloppiness, my obsessive tendencies, liking to work in an iterative kind of way, revisiting something again and again. All of that can be served by this project, which was the first real studio-based project I had. So that's this work. I called it Smoke and Mirrors because it was literally Smoke and Mirrors, but it was also a kind of pun on, on illusionism and, and magic, and you know, there are many ways to take, take that term. These are all analog photographs. All the effects that you see, all the color, is generated in the shooting of the photographs by gels and the lights printed in a very straightforward way. No double exposures, no manipulating the color um, beyond the sort of normal um, alterations you make in the color darker. Sometimes the smoke wasn't present in the image because the smoke wasn't always easy to capture. It was the sort of random element in a more tightly controlled setup. And this is the first big show I did. It was in 2005. Uh, my husband's a painter, and he was supposed to do a solo show at a gallery in Paris called um, Sutton Lane. And they had um, a very large space, and he's, he was kind of complaining about having to fill this large space with work. And he suggested that maybe we do a show together where I just pose my photographs with his paintings. So we decided that I would show 20 photos and he would show 20 paintings. And they were all, um, we designated one size, 24 by 20 inches. They were all framed in the same kind of generic silver frame. So, so there was a uniform um, presentation of the work. It was hung in this very simple manner around the room, kind of uniform distance. And it wasn't, we didn't hang it in a one-to-one -one way where it was photo painting, photo painting. We just would sort of create relationships visually or otherwise between these images and, and hang them however it seemed um, to make sense at the time. And this was the first time that I really started thinking about installation. I think until you start showing, it's hard to sometimes to think about that. With photographs, a lot of those decisions are somewhat arbitrary, what size we put something, whether it's matte or it's glossy, whether we put things under glass or not. So in this show, I started thinking about photographs as objects for the first time, and also thinking of them as fragments that can kind of be configured to work together in groups. So this is an image of that show. First, when I put work in my first group show, I remember asking a professor of mine, 
they, I was supposed to edition this photograph. I was supposed to write down like, uh, how many prints were in the edition. And I never thought about it before. And I said to her, what's a standard photo edition? She said, five plus one AP is pretty standard. So I, I worked with this unit of six for a while. I was interested in the whole construct of editioning, which is a way to create value for a photograph um, in, in an art context or in a market context, because if a photo had an open edition of 1,000, um, it could be it could charge the same. Um, you could charge for it the, at the same rate that you can when you limit the edition. So the artificiality of editioning and how that confers a kind of value on the photograph was interesting to me. So I created this piece, which was uh, which is called the full edition of Smoke and Mirrors 24A. It's one photograph. It's printed six times, and then it's sold as one thing. So this kind of takes the edition and folds it back into a unique piece. It caused a lot of problems for my dealer, which I thought was interesting too, because a lot of people didn't want to buy all six. They only wanted to buy one. And I, I told him they had to buy all six, and they could put five of them in their closet if they wanted to. That was what I wanted to do. And it did prove to be very difficult, so but that's OK. Um, in this piece, this is a diptych. It's called Red Goya. I was also thinking again about just about formats and about size, about the different kind of authority that photographs have at different sizes. This is one 30 by 40 and one 20 by 24 um, print of the same negative. And I always kind of use standard sizes um, in the different um, formats that I present. And I was interested in how the 20 by 24 doesn't exactly map in terms of scaling up to what 30 by 40 is. The props are different. And just the, this was medium format negative, so the smaller prints had, had better resolution, the color was more kind of satisfying and jewel-like, but the larger print, the 30 by 40, had a certain amount of authority because it was, it was more imposing. I was interested in seeing those two things next to each other. And also, like the last piece, just emphasizing the fact that these are photographic prints, that they're not photograms, they're not one-offs, they're reproducible. And thinking about how that <coughs> fact that they are not unique might undermine their um, seductiveness in a way, or change the way people regarded them. So those are some things I was thinking about. It's a close-up. Go ahead. Are you going to show people why, or tell people why it's Goya? Goya? Yeah, there's a can of Goya beans up at the, um, you can just see the A kind of on top, a little bit to the right. Um, I was thinking, too, about um, like the painter Goya and his um, Harlequin paintings, but Anyway, I, I, I use all these things that I find in the studio when I'm shooting. I'm setting up mirrors, and sometimes the mirror will start to like, I work with these two by two foot mirror tiles from Home Depot. And sometimes the mirrors will slide around, and I need to prop them up with something, so I'm always grabbing whatever I can find. And some roommate had left you know, 20 cans of boy beans in the kitchen, so I started using these cans to prop things up. So that's why this one's red boy. The can just got into the shot by accident, and I decided that and these are some other images from my first solo <coughs> show um, in New York. It was at the Gallery Gallery in, um, in 2008. So you see Red Goya there, and then um, a couple of other prints that were made around at the same time. And when I shoot, I, I shoot in black and white and in color. So I'll set up something or arrange um, some objects, set up the camera, and then I'll, I'll change the lighting, and I might change my film stock from black and white to color, but I'll leave frame the same. So you might notice that some motifs appear with slightly different shadows or slightly different color. That's just the way that I work with the arrangements that I set up. So here's some other images of that. Uh, this was a show at um, Daniel Buchholz Gallery in Cologne that I did in uh, 2008. And again, I'm just wanting to show you a little bit about how I work with different scales. The black and white you see here is 50 by 60. The color print is uh, 30 by 40. So I like to have all these different sizes and, and um, different film stocks in one room. Maybe to just highlight the fact that these decisions about how things are printed are somewhat arbitrary, but they really change the way that we relate to these objects in the space. I also um, sometimes present the Polaroids that I generate. I use a lot of Polaroid because I actually can't see very well what my pictures are going to look like, so it's a proofing kind of mechanism for me. But with, with the death of Polaroid, um, Polaroids have a different kind of quality or a different sort of, um, 
there's something nostalgic about them, and there's definitely something precious about them because Polaroid film is, is hard to come by. And the Polaroids, I find, for me, sometimes are the freest expression of what I do because they might register something I tried but decided I wasn't interested in, a, in the moment that I didn't commit to more study or take more time to shoot. And um, sometimes it's the one that got away. They're interesting kind of um, unresolved thoughts that exist in the Polaroids. And the Polaroids just have, again, this question of presence. They have a different presence. There's something about, I don't know how many of you have even seen Polaroid film. Probably a lot of you have, but maybe not. It, it doesn't look like, a Polaroid doesn't look like any other kind of print. It has a very different color and a different sort of light. It's, it's hard to describe. They're soft in a way, but they have a different quality. So I've, I've started showing them alongside um, much larger works in the same space. I'm also interested in the fact that they that they don't last. Um, they, they're presented under UV glass, but I know eventually they're going to disappear or transform. So that's that's part of it. So it doesn't bother me that that can happen. Here's some Polaroids. Are these taken with a four by five? They were, yes. I, I should have mentioned that. But in the beginning, I was working with a medium format camera, and eventually I switched to four by five, and I almost exclusively work with four by five now. It's because of you know, the things I can do with tilts and swings, and swings um, working with perspective in different ways. And because it's a slow process for me, and I'm in the studio, it's not it's not a problem having a four by five. In the past, I worked with smaller cameras because I was working in the fields, mostly shooting landscapes before I started working this way. So again, some other arrangements of um, in that show at the gallery. I also made these kind of. Not exactly triptychs, but I would put three prints kind of in conversation with each other. These are some examples of that. And then in some shows, I would isolate certain motifs. Like, as I mentioned before, I might set something up and find that I'm interested in that setup. I'll lock the camera down, you know, keep the tripod in the same place, try to keep all the materials that are arranged in the same place, and then just play with the lighting. It's almost like a printing process, like having a screen and inking it so you see this kind of um, flower or star-like shape. That was one motif. It's called light flight. And then on the other side, there's another motif called Santa Fe. And they're they're all the same. It's just with different lighting. And in this show, it was at a gallery in LA. Um, I really wanted to emphasize that way of working. It was kind of like a more process-oriented installation. So maybe a viewer could get a sense of how I was manipulating these scenes. Um, I guess I think of it as a way of maybe making my presence more known as the author of these images. I don't know if people really get that when they look at them and they say, oh, this is the same thing and, and it's just different lighting. But I'm hoping that's a way of kind of um, making it apparent to people that, the, that this is a constructed image and that someone is, is actively building it and, and working with it. So on one side was one motif and on the other side was another. This was the um, museum show that Steele mentioned that I did at the ICA in Boston. And I this I brought together works that I put in a number of different shows. But again, I was still really thinking about installation and a lot about these different formats. On the back wall, I had this large uh, selection of, I mentioned earlier this idea. Somebody hit the button. Someone hit the button? You guys got to say. <laughs> this, 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 and 
decisions for a presentation than I was necessarily about what was happening within the frame. I was interested in that as well, but I was I was also really interested in causing people to think about these other decisions and presentation. And <clears throat> this show is one of the first shows I did where I, I presented the more I, I kind of I still chafe at the idea of calling these abstract photos, even though they are abstract because they're also not and all photos are abstractions, but if anyone has a better word for me, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain that. But um, on, on the side there, you see like a bouquet of flowers. So in this show, for the first time, I was juxtaposing the more abstract photographs that I've been making for a couple of years with um, other kinds of photos that I've been taking that were not of the same kind of still life setups. I guess I was interested in having those two different kinds of photographs talk to each other. And I've done that a lot more since, since doing this for the first time in 2008. Most of the shows I've done recently have had more straightforward photographs in conversation with the more staged images. This is a show in LA that I did um, about a year ago. And again, you'll see that there are some um, more conventional photographs I wanted to have photographs of people in the show, but I didn't want to shoot people again. So I actually mined my own archive of photos. This photo is from the early 90s. It was shown alongside larger kind of um, deteriorated Polaroid photographs. There's a castle in the town that I grew up in. I used to photograph a lot. Do you want to say something about the, the deteriorated sure. Polaroid images? Um, the Polaroid that we have been hoarding over the years, um, a lot of it's outdated, so there are these strange kind of erasures that take place, like what you see in that the one that has kind of the upper left sort of uh, has disappeared. That happened just because the Polaroid chemistry was kind of dry in the film. For a while I was greatly frustrated by these things and then decided that this was something that could uh, I could allow to enter my project and introduce a kind of chance element that I was interested in where these Absence, absences of information took place. On the right, I'm actually, um, I'm actually causing the film to deteriorate myself by letting it soak in a water bath. This film is, is called Positive Negative Polaroid. It produces a print and a viable negative that you can print from. It's, it's really quite amazing. It's, it's only black and white film that can do this, so you don't see any of this kind of um, these sort of effects taking place in the color prints. But the one on the right, I just let the film sit in a water bath for a couple and most of the image deteriorated. That's why those big holes are present. So it has this you know, effect, like maybe it was manipulated in the darker, but it can be addition because of that, those, those disruptions occur at the level of the negative. For some reason, additioning is really important to me. I can't, I don't make photographs, I, I make photographs. So. And I'm really interested in operating on the level of the camera. Everything I do is oriented at the lens. People have discussed my work along with the work of people like, like Liz Deshen or Wally Beshi, but they tend to work in a cameraless way. Um, the way I work is very much oriented at the lens. And um, here I just wanted to talk for a moment about materials, because I started thinking about what these materials that I'm using were saying. And even a dumb material, a canvas, um, it says something. I chose it because of its ability to be lit, because it can hold a certain shape. Um, its stiffness and kind of the way that I can manipulate it. But it also, um, it's the support of painting. So there's something of painting that gets smuggled in that way. And um, I think about muslin and the foundation of garments. So it has, it brings other associations with it. Here are some canvas photographs. Um, I should say that the bottom of this one was produced by, uh, this kind of striation was produced by sticking um, wet film together and letting it dry and then pulling it apart. So that's, um, that's how that happened there. When I shot this, I shot a piece of canvas straight on, hoping that I could make some sort of painterly gesture of mark on it later on by tearing it. And so um, that's, that's what occurred there. And then this other material I work with, the slab wall, I chose it for its graphic machine lines. And it allows me to slot in the mirrors that I work with quite easily. But it also has a relationship to retail. Um, and so there's, there's something in that that I think is, is secondary impression that you get when you look at it, because we see this all the time in retail settings. And then mirrors, 
for their lighting effects and hardness, for their geometric, uh, geometric angularity, but also for references to psychology, um, vanity, surveillance, the surface of modern architecture. The camera's there on the left, if you're, if you're looking, that's what that big shadow is. More mirrors. Canvas is so interesting, too, because it has to do with what texture and text and ease. Yeah. But yeah, text as in kind of what almost like in relation to writing or a, a site for ideas or that's true. The weaving of things. That's true. There's a different kind of tactile quality that it has. But I think I, the canvas that I shot, I, when Cheney and I were doing that show that I mentioned, the first show I was in where we put our photos and paintings together, that's when I first started photographing canvas and said, give me a piece of what you paint on. So we can create this kind of punning relationship between our two works, and that's that's how I started photographing canvas, and I've kept working with it since. And then some more mirror pictures, and then smoke. The smoke initially was the subject because of its relationship to, to the ghost, but really it came to stand more for formlessness and erasure because it would kind of erase parts of the image, and it also suggests to me some kind of an event or aftermath. I thought of the early pictures as being almost performance documents because I had to do crazy things in order to get the smoke where I wanted it in the, in the frame. And uh, you know, blowing it into different parts of the scene, using warm lamps to get it to travel in different ways. And so I think of these images as having some relationship to documenting an event that's not literally taking place in the picture. And it certainly suggests atmosphere, some kind of surplus, maybe magic. People talk a lot about intoxication or drugs in relationship to so the smoke has a lot of connotations as well. And then there's flowers. Um, I brought in flowers, photos of flowers, and then re-photographed pictures of flowers. Um, most of these pictures were taken in cemeteries. Um, so they have a funereal quality, but the flowers also stand for a kind of figural element. Um, they stand for renewal, ceremony, all sorts of things. interested in plaid because of the optical illusions that it generates, the retinal stains, but also it, it kind of it speaks to heritage, to old country and clans, a kind of Anglocentrism. It can speak to class and luxury. We could talk about Burberry or something along those lines. And then there are also just the objects that litter the studio that sometimes appear in my photographs, like the Goya food cans, paper towels. I guess I was thinking about Jan Gruber. I don't know how many of you know her work, but um, I discovered her work when I was quite young. And she, she did these amazing pictures of just forks and knives in her kitchen sink that are very, um, that are very close, closely zoomed in and sort of hard to read. There might be a, a, a plant reflected in the blade of a knife. And, but she, I always had the sense that she was working with whatever was at hand, but making it strange, making it really interesting. So I think about that when I work with these just everyday objects. Thinking about how the photograph or how the camera um, translates things and transforms things. And then uh, I started working more recently with yoga mats. Um, I just turned 40 and everyone was telling me it was time to get in shape and uh, take care of myself. So I can't tell you how many DVDs and yoga mats I've been given over the last few years. If you ever complain about your back, some friend will say, you should try yoga. So. Uh, and I notice everyone in my neighborhood in, in Williamsburg riding around with a yoga mat in their, in their uh, backpack as they take their bikes around the city. So I kept noticing these yoga mats and collecting them. I was thinking a lot about, about self-care, about spirituality, um, which I think is what turned me off of yoga initially. Uh, the first few classes I went to, there was a lot of chanting, and I couldn't really deal with that. And then class, as it's related to yoga, um, and sex. There was a big scandal last year about um, someone had authored an article about yoga's relationship to sex cults, how it started as a kind of tantric thing, and a lot of people got upset about that and said that it was tarnishing the good name of yoga. There were some scandals with different yoga masters you know, fathering children with a lot of their students. So all of these things were in my mind, and I was uh, and I was working differently with the yoga masks than I have with things in the past because I, I nailed them to the wall and manipulated them more by hand. They kind of allow themselves to be draped and scrunched and bunched. And 
I wasn't um, reflecting them in mirrors. I was just kind of pinning them to the wall and trying to form these shapes out of them, which was really exciting and liberating for me. I was thinking about like, way drape and hang, about plasticity and rubberiness, about this texture that they have, um, how the 4 by 5 can describe that, the tactility. And I was also thinking about um, some photographers that I really um, enjoy a lot. Like, this is just to show you what the mats kind of look like on the wall. Um, I'll kind of zoom in on different parts of them. But I was thinking about John Copland's, someone I've always really um, appreciated, and how he abstracted his own body. Um, I was also thinking about, um, this is Copland's, about Dido Moriama and um, these fishnet photos and some of his other photos where he abstracted the body. So that was on my mind when I was working with the yoga photos. And this is the show that I did kind of exclusively of this work um, in London this past fall. Something that was different about the show too was that I made digital secrets for the first time. Um, I'd always worked in an analog way. These were all shot on film. And uh, again, the lighting and the color all came from the studio setup, not from anything in post. But they're digital prints, so they have kind of an excess of information. Um, they were also printed in a glossy way. I never did that before either. So they're kind of, there's almost a surfeit of detail. They're all 50 by 60 too, large. Do you see them as sculptures as well? I do, in a way. I mean, I thought about just hanging. I like the way some of the mats look so much that I thought about just hanging them on the wall and not photographing them. But for me, the arrangements that I've made have always been so much oriented at the lens that they're not really that satisfying on their own. For years, people told me the mirror arrangements that I made, I should just like present those alongside the photographs, but they were never meant to be viewed in the round. They didn't really offer, they weren't interesting from different angles, only from like a very controlled perspective. And I still feel that way about these to some extent, but I, but they were the most interesting to me as objects of, of anything that I've done. So maybe someday I will just present them. But it's always been about the translation, the way the camera kind of um, alters things that was interesting to me. Also about how it sort of records something that's then absent, so you have that kind of uh, that ghost again yeah. of, of assumption. That's true. And there's a kind of yeah. There's a bit of a generational loss. Um, I think these are. I think you can really grasp what they are when you see them. But I was surprised that some people didn't know what they were. They didn't know they were yoga mats necessarily. Um, it seems so obvious. Again, you know, I was working in a kind of iterative way with the same setup, just working with the lighting. And then some of the images were standalone. They didn't have you know, multiple versions. You see here this, uh, let's see. This one was actually uh, the result of Polaroid film, too. It was a black and white negative. I was really interested in this strange cloud that appeared in the background, this kind of landscape or bust, like a sort of bustier <laughs> shape from the Polaroid disruption. So I actually made a color print of this, even though it was a, a black and white negative. I scanned it and colorized it so that it could be present in the show. I wanted to have that sort of random element that the uh, Polaroid film allowed. And now I just want to talk for a moment about the hand or the gestural mark, because that's something I think about a lot. Um, this is my hand. I put it photo of my hand in a show where I was thinking about the hand quite a bit as a way of um, maybe introducing that idea. But I, I allowed myself to get more into attacking the surface of this Polaroid over the last couple of years. The Mars that would happen naturally just from the negatives kind of rubbing against each other in a water bath or just the film falling apart on its own. I started really um, trying to, to force that more by sticking negatives together as I described that one on the left there by um, just manipulating the surface of the film and allowing it to really um, fall apart and corrode. <coughs> so I did things like um, sticking negatives together, agitating with nails, smashing the pods and the chemistry before I put it through um, into the back of the camera. Have you guys ever seen sheets of Polaroid film? You know how there's like an area where the chemistry flies. You can manipulate that and get these different effects. Because for a while I was literally painting on the mirrors as a way of trying to get my hand into the work, and that never seemed to work. This is one of the few that I could actually stand and print. Most of them were so ugly I couldn't, I couldn't even go there. But disrupting the, the surface of the emulsion seemed like a much better way to, to introduce the hand into a photograph than actual painting. The 
circles and you know, bubbles of um, air that were trapped between the two pieces of film. That's from agitating canals. Why do you care about your hand? I guess I guess that's one thing that I kind of isolated as a difference between photography and painting. It's just that people always people who don't like photographs very often cite the absence of my hand to talk about a photograph as being sort of mechanical reproduction that doesn't have that doesn't have a touch the way a painting might. And I don't really agree with that. I do think that someone's eye, maybe not their hand, is what is what distinguishes one photograph from another. But I was thinking about the hand a lot just as I was putting my work in more conversation with painting. And um, I share a studio with three painters, so it's me and the three of them. So I don't know, I guess I guess I think about painting a lot. Isn't that image of the hand? Hmm. Isn't that an old image? It is, yeah, that photograph is also from when I was a teenager. So so, so is there sort of like also something interesting that happens with um, in a way with time or memory in terms of going back and bringing that work forward to relate to the work you're doing? I think so. I have this way of not, I kind of recycle things in my work a lot. Like I'll go back to a certain motif that I might have shot, since I was saying I shoot in this iterative way and I might have 50 versions or something and just put two or three in the show. So sometimes I'll reach back remembering a motif or I have another version of that that I can, that I can put in contact with the newer work that I'm making now. So I have this way of just thinking of everything I've ever shot as being equally available to me. Um, and I remember this hand photograph, so I dug you know, back into boxes of film and found it, rather than trying to, I thought about restaging it, and then I said, why not just print the existing photograph? So there's, there is a kind of circularity to the way I work. Um, I sort of don't necessarily privilege the new work or the older work. So that's, that's where the hand comes from. Also, I've been photographing these quilts that, um, that I think some of the geometric ways I work are influenced by these Amish quilts that my mother and grandmother make. And they also allow me to think about the hand a little bit. This large one that you see here on the left is the back side of the quilt. I'm not sure if I have a close up of that, I do. But when you look at it up close, you see some mistakes and some, and some errors. Um, again, the presence of the hand um, in, in craft. I think about like, art and craft a lot as well what the distinction is between you know, high art and more, more popular art forms. This erasure you see here in the center of this image is from manipulating the chemistry pod. So again, that kind of happens and I'm not, I have no control over where it takes place. But here I was really interested in these deep shadows that took place along the side of this kind of crevice. It gives it a lot of depth and dimensionality. Sounds really exciting the way this one came out. What are you going to do when you can't get your hands on Polaroid material? I mean, is there? I don't know. <laughs> get a digital back or something. Like that? I would definitely work with a digital back. I think I know there's this. Sometimes there's this argument where some people claim that analog photography is more authentically photography than digital photography. And I don't really feel like I'm not. I'm, I'm not on either side of that divide. I I just came up in an analog environment. And so that's what I know, and that's what I do out of you know, laziness more than anything. When I have to work digitally, I will. Like part of the reason I made digital, large digital prints for this show in London was just that I couldn't make 50 by 60 prints in an analog way that were color. I could only do black and white that way, just because of the limitations of machines and, and other um, and other um, sort of technical <coughs> things on the color side of photography. So. When I can't get Polaroid anymore, I'll figure out how to have fun with the digital back and get it to do things that are you know, wonky. wonky or backwards or however. I'm sure there are ways to, to, uh, to do that, but it's just an environment that I don't know very well um, for the time being. But I'll be very sad when there's no more Polaroid, that's for sure. <coughs> and uh, I want to talk a bit now about Kitchen Show, which is the show that, that I did most recently. Um, this past fall, it opened in November. The Kitchen was up for a couple of months. And um, this show was an exciting opportunity for me because I wanted to work collaboratively. I hadn't really done that. I 
done shows where I put my work in conversation with other people's work. <coughs> Do you have the time stamp? Yeah, it's 2.20. I would say we're, we're fine. Totally fine. So I put my work in conversation with other people's work, but I haven't, I haven't really collaborated actively with someone. So I asked my friend Matt Keegan, someone that I've known for over a decade, if we could do a show together. And we started our show um, about a year before it opened, so it was around um, when Occupy was first taking place in New York. And we were thinking a lot about uh, what it means to be an artist now in this kind of convulsive time for our society, and thinking about how people were living in public at Zuccotti Park, and how they were negotiating that, people from different walks of life, and with different political backgrounds, with different agendas, how they were working together and living together. And so we decided that we wanted to do a show together that reflected on some of these things. We didn't know exactly where we were going with it. But we spent about a year talking, and only in the last few months before the show, actually making work. And I started taking pictures and videos off my balcony. This is the view from my balcony in Brooklyn of the Freedom Tower that's going up there in the background. Um, I don't know if you can see it up there to the left. For a while, I thought it was just another Williamsburg condo. I'd seen so many condos go up. And then one day, I realized what it was, um, the Freedom Tower. And so I started photographing it. and over several months documented its progress as it becomes plated with glass. So this is just a shot of it. And there was a much longer video of, of, kind of different short videos I've taken of it being constructed. Um, this is an installation shot of the show. And on the left, there's a video of kind of a conversation that Matt and I had over several months about our, our backgrounds. Um, it was supposed to be the narration for a film we made, and it ended up being a separate sort of text-based piece. And so, um, yeah, we were thinking about our time, 2012, our place, uh, Williamsburg, where we both have lived for, so, for about a decade. And yoga came into this show as well. That's why I see those yoga balls. We were thinking about presence, about self-care, about class and lifestyle. Um, and the pieces that we made that reflected more on our backgrounds, this text piece on the left, we were thinking about where we came from, how we got where we are now, um, and where we were going with the election kind of dawning. You know, Obama hadn't been reelected yet. The constant flow forward in time, just thinking about these things. The show was rooted in a conversation about everything from aging and health to politics, quality of life, and a desire to picture our experience outside the Hermetic studio, the kind of output that we, that we are generally known for. I'm going to read the press release for the show just because um, I hope you <coughs> clarify this more. Um, Keegan and Quinlan have been friends for over a decade. This collaboration is rooted in their ongoing dialogue. Meditating on the intersection of their private and professional lives, the artists were prompted to pose questions about spirituality, health, and lifestyle. Such concerns help to shed the specific and intimate parameters of this exhibition and move it into a space of generative abstraction. What areas of our lives demand constant or daily practice? How might, we, how might we locate sustained political engagement while moving through the mundane cycles of morning, noon, and night? Like art, yoga is an activity that requires its practitioners to remain anchored in the current moment. Keegan and Quinlan were initially drawn to yoga mats as a skin-like material that functions as a stand-in for the body. As this exhibition developed, their own bodies became directly implicated. Leading up to yoga, which was the name of the show, the artists kept their focus on the present, but all the while feeling the weight of the past and pull of the future on their lives. The Freedom Tower is becoming part of the skyline. The Occupy movement had its first birthday, and the 57th US presidential election will take place during the run of this exhibition. Corresponding with these developments is their increasing awareness of the strata of generations, artistic and personal, whose different approaches to art and life must be seen in relationship to shifting political and social realities. So these are some pictures of the show. Um, over there on the right was a large frieze of 20 black and white photographs that were just nailed directly to the wall. We chose to work with the wall in that way because Matt actually cuts into the wall and it makes a lot of work that's, that's directly applied to the wall rather than framing them discreetly and having them kind of function more as traditional photographs. The centerpiece of the show is this two-channel video which you see in that kind of black box in the back. So the photos were my work. Um, they weren't done collaboratively, but Matt and I worked on these sculptures together. Those are bags of my laundry, and he draped yoga mats that he was cutting into textiles kind of over the bags. Um, I had 
always wanted to work sculpturally, and I felt like the closest I was getting was, was generating lots of laundry at home and dealing with these laundry bags, so I decided to just bring them into the gallery and put them on pedestals. And Matt thought of them as a kind of body, so he started dressing them. That's how they became what they are. The blue one is called Elmo. The orange one is called Garfield. And the green one is, anyone have a guess? The green one? Kermit. Kermit, that's right. It's Kermit. So that's Matt's piece in the back, more like mother and more like father. That's the quilted photograph we showed earlier. Um, the line is called Constant Common. And then on the far right is another piece of Matt's. It's called Grids. So again, my photographs and Matt's work, and then some collaborative work, the sculptures and the videos. The yoga balls were not really art. They were just seating, roamed around the gallery. Um, this is the video. I'm going to show just a couple minutes of it. Is there time for that? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're good. or just a, you know, a simple description of what Matt does, because that's sort of hard to do. It is kind of hard to do. I mean, Matt works a lot with text. He's interested in things. He keeps notes on things he hears people say on the street. There are a lot of phrases that he'll use in his work, more like mother, more like father. Any day now is another phrase that he's used in, um, in, in his work in the past. Uh, this comes from a supermarket circular in this painting. He had a painter copy it for him. Um, and then that's my yoga photographs it actually says Bali Total Fitness, so it's kind of tipping my hand a little more than some of the others. Um, these, the, the red grids piece of Matt's, this one, it's, it's a number of small photographs. His mother teaches English as a second language um, in, their, in, their, in the small town that he grew up in, and she teaches using these flashcards that she generates out of just um, magazines and sort of commercially available images. She takes these stock images and uses them to teach people English, whether it's about shoes and ties and whatever it is. And um, she recently retired from teaching and gave Matt all her materials, and he's been using them to create these collages. So I'm not sure exactly how we would frame the discussion, or the selections that he's made here, but he works with a lot of um, sort of commercially available material. And I mean, we were both thinking, we were thinking about lifestyle and about heritage a little bit. Matt was working with his mother's flashcards. I was working with my mother's clothes. These cards also come from his mother's collection. This piece is called Children. I was really pregnant when we were working on the show, too, and I think we were all thinking about babies and family, things like that. That's Kermit. Matt uh, created this found an image like this in a supermarket circular, and where his leg is, there was actually a yoga mat in the image that he copied. But it was a very strange pill bottle that was spilling out all this stuff in, in, in the initial ad, and he replaced all of the um, <coughs> all of the uh, things that were being advertised in the pill bottle with, with products that he uses a lot. So this is his, his version of that. It's more like a self-portrait, I guess. It's called Cornucopia.
about ten lines. Seemed like a good enough place to sort of stop at the beginning yeah. of the production. <coughs> So, questions, comments, thoughts, observations? Who edited the video? Um, it was edited by my brother in law, actually, he's a great editor. We worked closely with him, but he created some really good relationships between the two channels, which was important. But I couldn't have edited it. I don't know how to edit very well as it is, but I felt like I was too close to all of it, so I really let him kind of make a pass and then just made some little changes to that. Was it time? It wasn't the times weren't exact? No, the times weren't exact at all. It was more like, well, it was just, we didn't want to end up with tons and tons of footage, so the only, we directed the DPs to just shoot for 10 minutes an hour, so once they got the 10 minutes, they had to stop until the next hour, but they covered different parts of the day. It was interesting to us, the DPs were two best friends and they had such similar sensibilities, it really looks like it could have been shot by, by one person, which was interesting. But yeah, I, I just, I felt very uneasy about being photographed in this way, so I just stayed out of it. I didn't talk to the DP very much at all during the day. I didn't even know where he was a lot of the time. I just tried to ignore him. And with the editor, we gave him a lot of freedom too to just kind of make sense of the material on his own. It's very busted. Uh, it's, it seems like the like working with film and Polaroid is kind of like a way for you to take this thing that you're like it's like you're like you have your hands so heavily in it to kind of like surprise yourself a little bit like what like is, I mean I know you talked about it a little bit but I mean like what do you uh, is that is that a big part of the process for you or do you feel like like once that's gone like what are you gonna do it is a big part of the process I mean I think one of the things that we all learn about photography is is it's you're out shooting in the world, you can capture things you wouldn't expect around any given corner. When you're working in the studio, how do you introduce chance sort of into, into your process? And one way that I found to do it was on the level of material, but I'm sure there are ways to sort of screw up the works digitally as well, but I don't know what they are. And I've always been um, a little, I'm shy of working digitally because it seems like you have so much more control and so many tools. And all of those tools, there's probably a lot of ways that you can then you know, go off the rails if that's something court those kind of mistakes so uh, the, the chance part of it is really important to me because I can be sort of obsessive and there's something very rigid about the way these things are set up in front of the camera but then the smoke function that way in the beginning that was the unpredictable element and now it's like this chemical intervention on the level of film but I hope there'll always be something like that and they can already keep me really excited about what we're doing. Anyone? Yes that's sort of dope. photographs before I discovered his paintings. And if you guys haven't seen them, they're really pretty amazing. And he had a dark room in his studio. Um, he just did everything wrong, basically, with the way he washed his prints and processed them. So there are always these interesting stains. And he introduced a lot of um, photographic emulsions into his paintings, so he got his painting wrong. But again, I just I kind of, when I went to art school at the museum school, it was very interdisciplinary, and I was around a lot of painters. So. Live more closely. This could be actually, a, um, I guess, a big polka retrospective at um, MoMA and other next year sometime. And um, there's a, there's a, you can find it. There's this really interesting book of polka photographs. There's a show, I think, about um, MoCA in LA about 10 years ago or something like that. And it's kind of fascinating to look at that work because there are a lot of photographers of Eileen's generation, more or less, who are kind of dealing with the materiality or break or different ways of sort of breaking apart the kind of the, the technology and the materiality of the medium. And Polka was, you know, he was there doing a lot of thinking along those lines, you know, yeah. 30, 40 years ago, as were of course people back in the kind of Bauhaus era as well. So it's yeah, I've always suffered from being not exactly like I've always kind of even when I tried to be really careful with photography, I'd make a lot of mistakes. I'm kind of a sloppy person. And Polka was really sloppy too, and he made his sloppiness a strength instead of a weakness. And I think when I discovered his work as an undergrad, um, 
I was really excited because he was he was scratching negatives and working into the emotion. He was doing all those things that were so taboo in the way that I was being taught photography. I was really excited. And so, uh, but yeah, you can you can also see his work at Leo Koenig if you ever go to his gallery. He has a lot of old press prints. They're very often like in the back. They have a lot of them. And the whole the whole question of impurity is, or of yeah accident and mistake. It's um, so often people are sort of um, I don't know maybe taught or trained to get that stuff out of their work because it gets in the way. It uh, makes things messy or inarticulate, and in a way you've kind of made that part of the central subject of your work is sort of where the machine, um, where the glitches occur, where the machine breaks down, where other kinds of image making come in. And, um, Definitely, and it, it took me a long time to give myself permission though to actually cause things to happen to the film. Like I would be happy when something got scratched by accident and I would maybe know that you're not supposed to put 20 sheets of film in one type of work container, they will scratch each other. But I, I didn't allow myself to actually go in and scratch the surface of the film. And so and I still won't allow myself to do it with a stylus or something that's that's more that I can be somewhat compositional about the marks that I'm making. So that's why I came to this idea of putting nails in a coffee can with a with a film and some water and shaking it. So then I get some of these effects that are not really determined by my taste or my hand or whatever I consider it to be an interesting mark at that time. But it's it's funny this the kind of limits that we put on ourselves. It took me years to say like I can let this I can soak this film too long and see what happens, or I can I can um, put it in harm's way essentially. I didn't do that for a long time. It only mattered to me that I knew that those mistakes happened naturally, but it took a while to to get over that. It's strange. And I actually have one more. I have another question, sort of about. I guess it has to do with a little bit with where you may be heading, and I mean, you know, one often doesn't know. Um, but I mean, having brought video in here, um, having had what a little bit of a break now, this having a new child, the, you know, this sort of there's this way, the way an artist works, where you kind of there are sort of intense periods of activity, uh, where you know, the way it's a lot about just getting the work made and. and all that gets focused, and then the work is made. There's an exhibition, and then one reflects, and sort of uses that time to maybe reorient. And so I'm just kind of, you know, wondering. I've been enjoying. I mean, I, I definitely slowed down towards the end of my pregnancy. I, I, I did this show pretty late in the pregnancy, actually. But I uh, working with Matt was great because it opened me up to making video, which I'd never done before, and working um, to make sculpture and just thinking about something outside of the kind of photographic practice that I've had for so long. And I'm not sure that I'll continue to do those things on my own, um, even though I really appreciate what I did here and I feel like I learned uh, and stretched myself. But I think with this time that I've had, I've just, I've enjoyed um, just looking at art again because we all get busy with our lives and I have two kids. So if I have to choose between making my own work or going and looking at work, very often I'll go to the studio and make my own work. But sometimes I think that enhances this sort of hermetic like kind of spinning that I can do within my own kind of little world that I've constructed. And so I've just been enjoying looking at other photographs. There's a great show up at MoMA right now. Um, it's called Inventing Abstraction. And there are photographs by Coburn, the Horacis, this English group of artists. And he actually designed something that looks a lot like the photographs I make where he has this kind of prism that he attaches to the front of the camera. <coughs> But I've, I've been looking at work and also <clears throat> I like to read a lot about artists' lives. I think it's really interesting. Now that I'm, I've been an artist for 10 years or so, I wonder what's going to happen in 10 more years. How do I sustain you know, this kind of interest and, and energy and feed myself, kind of grow and branch out? And so I, I read a book about Lee Miller last year that was really interesting to me. And, and now I'm reading a book about Lee Krasner. And, and that's, that also prompted me to want to look at my own life a little bit the way I did it to be a very simple way. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I do. Mm -hmm. Lee Miller, of course, was she married to Man Ray? Or she 
she was she was she actually first. invented solarization even though man ray got the credit the ray drafts but um she was man ray's <coughs> friend and studio assistant and a really great photographer in her own right but kind of part of this surrealist <coughs> group in paris um, that uh, didn't necessarily support the female artists as well uh, historically as, as as the men were remembered and she ended up with roland penrose who was a famous surrealist painter and was kind of her work is really interesting because she did incredible fashion and, and art kind of studio-based photography, but she was also a war photographer in World War II. And um, she was working for Vogue magazine, and she took incredible pictures and was in the center of the action. And was awarded, like, you know, it was, she become like a the Legion of Honor for the, you know, these French, big French awards. Yeah, yeah, she did some really important work. Um, so she's a great <coughs> character. She's also a famous muse of a lot of the surrealists. <clears throat> she appears in Cocteau's film on the blood of an artist as, as a kind of Venus with no arms. You'll recognize her if any of you look at pictures. She's featured in a lot of men rights photographs. She started as a model and a artist. So yeah, the lives of artists are really interesting. How one stays an artist. <laughs> There's time. also just um, just for Natalie and I were talking about this a little bit when she came in, in relation to the video piece that she and Matt did, uh, the sort of tracking or almost surveillance of the daily life. There's a piece up right now at uh, House from Worth in Chelsea. Um, it's a Dieter, there's a big Dieter Roth show, R-O-T-H. And um, I don't know if any of you have seen this show, but in it, there is a, a wall-long installation of a hundred, I think it's a hundred small uh, video screens and Rhodes, who was kind of getting older and his body was sort of falling apart, <coughs> installed in, um, surveillance cameras all around his house and studio that ran basically 24 hours a day. And this wall, you know, it's the length of this wall and maybe longer of all these video screens, basically has all of this footage running. I mean, it's everything from him sitting at his desk to go to sleeping to going to the bathroom. That's the show that they brought his studio floor into? Exactly, yeah. yeah. That sort of fetishization of the floor. But, um, anyway, um, that's kind of an aside. Um, before we say thank you to Eileen, I just want to remind everybody that next week, uh, Ken Jacobs is coming in, um, sort of famous filmmaker. Um, I think it's on Wednesday. Check the calendar. Thank you, Arlene, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.